This video is sponsored by NordVPN. World of Warcraft is a fantasy game, and you can't have fantasy without... Magic. On your adventures in Azeroth, you'll find different forms of magic that can range from holy and righteous to pretty flowers and nature and fuzzy cute animals, <laughs> and even abhorrently evil and downright demonic forms of magic. The origin of most of this wizardry is based off of the most fundamental aspects of the Warcraft universe. Before there was an Azeroth, there was nothing. But you can't have nothing without something. So in the nothing, there was energy that came from something. The most basic forces in the universe are the light and the void. These forces are the yin and yang that keep each other in check. Without light, there is no black abyss of darkness. Without darkness, you can't shine the brightest light. And, oh, well, bro, we are getting really deep. So, uh, okay, so there's these cosmic forces. They clash with each other. Uh, uh, that's how life is born on the universe. There's some titan dudes, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Azeroth is there, and here we are now. These cosmic powers can be tapped into the form of holy or shadow magic. First, let's talk about holy. Imagine if the Pope actually had superpowers and he could use the Force. That is what holy magic is, for the humans at least. In order to call upon the light to aid you, it requires your complete willpower to harness this mysterious Force and faith that what you are doing is completely morally right. <laughs> If you aren't completely faithful to the light and don't have the required positive vibes, you'll fail the vibe check and the light will not aid you. The Church of the Holy Light is founded on three virtues to make sure that you have these positive vibes. Respect, and noticing your place in the universe and strive to fight for its well-being. The tenacity to fight in the name of the light and realizing that even the smallest actions can change the world for the better. And finally, a balance of compassion and consideration if your aid will transfer to a positive change in the universe. Sounds fine. Following all these rules will allow a member of the church to manifest a world of honor and justice. Yeah. Now keep in mind, Light Magic's morality is based on the person that is wielding it. A perfect example of the light being used in a harmful way is the Scarlet Crusade who think the outside world is full of unclean heretics, tainted by the evil stench of- Hey! 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 I'm at focus here, we're talking about critical aspects of the lore! Of course, the outside world isn't full of plague-infested monsters, but the Scarlet Crusade illustrates how faith can turn into devout fanaticism that makes them close-minded lunatics. Other races on Azeroth have also accessed the powers of the light through different cultural means. Sunwalkers worship the sun and she, which manifests into using more sun-based light attacks. You also have the Draenei, who have direct communication with the Naru, who are pure manifestations of light. Hell, you even have the Lightforged Draenei, who are basically super soldiers who have let their bodies become a vessel to dispense light's justice. And there's even the Blood Elves who enslaved a Naru and sucked out its life juice. <laughs> what? Elves being dicks? Whoa, yeah, no, totally haven't heard that one before. But what if, no matter how much faith you had, the light still abandoned you? For the Forsaken, this is the harsh reality they must deal with. Priests suffering from undeath can still call upon the light and it can still heal them, but it is just excruciatingly painful. In fact, channeling holy magic and being healed by it can have a side effect where an undead can regain their senses. They can taste the decay in their mouths. They can smell the rotting flesh and feel the maggots crawling beneath their skin. So yeah. It's, it's not fun being an undead. In fact, it's really depressing, actually. And that is why undead who were once members of the Church of the Holy Light have transitioned to a new form of practice. While holy magic focuses on the emotions of the heart, like hope, courage, and comfort, the powers of shadow incite emotions of the mind, like despair, doubt, and panic. 
In the light, you stand together as one, but in darkness, you are alone, fanatical in your pursuit for indescribable power. Shadow Priests play off this characteristic of the corruptive influence of the mind. Harnessing the powers of the void involves riding the fine line between immense power and utter insanity as your mind falls victim to the old gods. Within the Forsaken, the Cult of Forgotten Shadow is where many summoners of the shadows lie, but users of the void are in old god cults like the Twilight Hammer or even the Black Empire. And speaking of evil corruptions... The powers of fell magic are just as, if not more, addictive than the Void. The most infamous users of this corruptive magic are the Burning Legion, of course. They are a near-infinite army filled with demons that call the Twisting Nether their home. This plane of existence was created when the powers of the Light and Void clash together on a cosmic scale, and this is where a lot of the fell and other magical energies reside. Every demon you find in the Warcraft universe was once uncorrupted, but under the command of the Legion, they've been tainted and twisted. The obvious example are the Eridar, who used to be Draenei, but accepted Sargeras' gift of power and they turned, uh, uh they turned red. And, and, and mean and angry. Also, Draenei who have been affected by Fel but have rejected its influence have transformed into the malformed Broken. Fel Hunters are also a great example of Fel's influence. This is what they look like now, but this is what they used to look like. These demons can also be summoned by practitioners of Fel, but in order to summon one, a soul is needed. Could you help? Please help me. <laughs> now, warlocks are not inherently evil per se, but when your class revolves around sucking the life force out of innocence, harnessing chaotic and corrupting magic, and being shunned by most of society, it's kind of hard not to be the bad guy. Using Fell is sort of a get-rich-quick style of spellcasting. It takes time to learn, but you can get a pretty high power level relatively quickly compared to practicing other forms of magic. But the side effects of being a warlock include slowly turning into a demon, having everybody hate you, the sudden urge to burn down orphanages, vomiting, and also having the need to help your friends by summoning them and giving them cookies. So they aren't that evil. Hooray! While Fell represents chaos, its counterpart is arcane magic, a form of magic that requires order and... Knowledge! Think of arcane magic kind of like the science of Warcraft. In order to hone such magic, it requires years and years of study in places like Dalaran, Stormwind's Mage Quarter, or Azuna, or really any other school. One of the reasons why it takes so much studying is because how diverse the magic really is. You can shoot pure arcane magic, or you can manifest it into fire or frost. There's abjuration, configuration, transmutation, annihilation, evisceration, mutation. But really, there's a lot of stuff you can do with arcane, from making muffins to teleporting around the world. And by the way, um... According to this book in the game, apparently it is possible for inexperienced mages to blink into walls, furniture, or even other people, and uh, they suffocate and they die, which is horrifying. A lot of the magic-focused places on Azeroth are built on top of ley lines. Think of these kind of like Azeroth's blood vessels, except they're filled with magic. The only problem is the Burning Legion loves finding these high doses of magic and corrupting it. So users of Arcane need to find a way to mask the high Arcane Dense locations. They can do this by setting up runestones around their city, you could make your city float in the sky, but those are not foolproof ways to make sure that you are protected. Oh no no. The mages have kept something powerful locked beneath Dalaran to protect them. And 
that's NordVPN, the sponsor of today's video. What if I told you the Burning Legion is real and are cyber hackers trying to steal your information? With NordVPN, you can mask your IP address and be anywhere in the world, like the UK, Spain, Africa, Stormwind, Orgrimmar, okay, well, maybe not those last two, but anywhere else in the world, and enjoy the internet stress-free knowing that you are safe. Not only do you get the best cybersecurity on the market, but you can have up to six connections, and it also unlocks region-locked websites like Netflix, and if you don't like it, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. But don't take my word for it. Hear what one of the most prestigious mages of Dalaran has to say about NordVPN. Hello, hello, my name is my name is Kadgar and I love NordVPN. Yeah, that's right. And look at all of these other technological experts that recommend NordVPN. Get 68% off of NordVPN, which is only $3.71 a month, plus an additional month free at NordVPN.com slash PlatinumWow or using the code PlatinumWow at checkout. Thank you NordVPN for making this video possible. Back to the video. The ad is now over. But really, some mages of Dalaran like Kel'Thuzad are frustrated with the whole concept of morality getting in the way of their studies. And that is why many mages have fallen into the dark arts known as necromancy. Necromancers practice the art of raising the dead and honing the craft of necrotic magic. Over time, their bodies will slowly decay, causing them to wither into the very creatures they raise into unliving. <laughs> Some of the most powerful necromancers are liches, of course. These high-ranking necromancers have had their souls linked to a container called a phylactery. In order to kill a lich for good, you must destroy their phylactery. The most famous lich is Kel'Thuzad, and in classic, we didn't destroy his phylactery and gave it to some random guy. That's why in Wrath of the Lich King, he returned and then we defeated him again, and apparently he's in the Shadowlands now, where we'll probably defeat him again. All that I am, anger, cruelty, vengeance, I bestow upon you, my chosen knight. I have granted you immortality, so that you may herald in a new, dark age for the Scourge. Death Knights are another example of powerful wielders of death magic. These warriors were raised by the Lich King himself, imbued with magic and trained to be the ultimate killing machines to serve as a weapon to force all of Azeroth into undeath. Many of the Death Knights defected during the Battle of Light's Hope Chapel, and despite them being free from the Lich King's grasp, they are still machines of death. All Death Knights struggle with an urge called Eternal Hunger, which is an unstoppable urge to inflict pain and suffering on the living on a regular basis. If Death Knights don't scratch this itch, they'll fall into madness and go on an unstoppable murder frenzy, which is the most badass and edgy thing I've ever heard in the Warcraft universe. And I'd love to talk about it more, but we have more magic to talk about. Druidism is the total opposite of necromancy. Being a druid is all about hugging trees, the beauty of the living world, and probably never taking a shower. Ew. The first druid ever was Malfurion, who learned the ways of nature from Cenarius. Knowledge. And the way druids have such an intense connection to the world is their ability to access the Emerald Dream. The Emerald Dream is a magical realm created by the Titan Freya to represent a blueprint of how Azeroth should be formed. It's a version of Azeroth not affected by intelligent beings that altered the lands, so the dream flourishes with natural life. In the plane of existence we live in, druids take a long slumber while in the dream, and during the slumber they gain an incredibly deep connection with nature which translates to harnessing its powers. I'm awake, I'm awake. There are tons of different branches of druidism one can explore. There are druids of the claw, talon, fang, grove, antler, scythe, raccoon, ant, 
muskrat, monkey, because just like nature, druidism is incredibly diverse. But druidism is just one aspect of nature that deals with living things. But the other side of nature is more primal and deals with the elements that are the building blocks of Azeroth. Since the world's very creation, the elements of water, fire, air, and earth have been in a battle for supremacy. The shamans are mediators who keep the elements of our world in check, making sure one is never stronger than the other, and harnesses these raging elemental forces to strike down their enemies. The relationship between a shaman and the elements they wield is like a partnership. A shaman must be in good standing with the elements and work in their favor in order to harness their power. And then there are goblins. This is one of the most goofiest race and class combos in the game. Goblins are greedy little monsters all about making as much money as possible with the smallest amount of effort. They don't really care about the world. At all. The elements are business partners who have been convinced to sign a contract which seems reasonable, but in the fine print it states that the goblins can harness the powers of the elements for their own personal gain. I feel like this is kind of a bit of a stretch to make this connection, but uh, at the end of the day, who cares? At this point, WoW class and race restrictions are kind of just arbitrary lines in the sand. <laughs> and that is all the magic we'll be talking about today. There are other subcategories, but maybe we can talk about those in another video. So yeah, I'll see you guys later. Magic away! Gaze into my eyes and witness your doom!